<clears throat> All right, so if you're in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 23 here, uh, we'll var start in verse 23, uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. And this is a real famous chapter where Jesus is rebuking uh, the Pharisees and calling them out for being hypocrites and all of the, the wickedness that they were doing. And if you're in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. And tonight the title of the sermon is Judgment, Mercy, and Faith. And those three things uh, that Jesus talked about is what I'm going to be talking about uh, this evening. And basically Jesus saying that these are the weightier matters of the law. You know, if there's anything in the Bible and the law of God that's important, these are three of the top things that are the most important things. And I, you know, I'm going to go tonight and explain why they're important, why there's be something we should pay attention to. And uh, go back to verse 16, because you see the Pharisees, you know, they were all screwed up in their doctrine. The things that they emphasized were not the things that God emphasizes. You know, one of the things that they emphasized a lot was money. And if you're in verse 16, it says, Won't you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You see, the Pharisees cared more about gold than they cared about the temple or about the ordinance that... that ordinances that God had created, you know, gold and money, covetousness, you know, that was one of the main things that they cared about. Uh, that was one of the problems they had. If you would go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, just a few pages to the left in your Bible, and you know, there's a lot, uh, you know, money is, it's a part of our lives, and a lot of people spend a lot of time making money, and obviously you need money to eat, you need money to have a place to live, you know, it's important. But there are other things in life that are more important than money. Amen. And uh, if you're in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 21, the Bible says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. In verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So Jesus here is saying that if there's somebody who's a brother that you have strife with, and you have odds with, you know, before you start giving gifts to church or donating things upon the altar, he said it's more important that you reconcile with your brother. You know, relationships are often way more important than just money. You know, a lot of people think that maybe if they give a big donation to church or if they give a big donation to some charity out there that's doing a good work, that that'll make God pleased with them. But, you know, God's more pleased just when you, uh, you know, have good fellowship, when you get along with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Relationships are, are much more important than just money. And if you would go to uh, Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> but the Pharisees had this all wrong. The Pharisees, you know, they kind of made money the most important thing. It says that they tithe of, of the mint and the anise and the cumin. You know, they, they're tithing of the increase when they grow these little crops, you know, in their garden. And, and they're, you know, just those little crops of, of just... Uh, you know, mint and other spices would grow. You know, they might tithe on that and bring a handful of that down to church. And obviously they should have tithed on that. But it's almost like they emphasize that, like that's the most important thing. As long as they're real strict on their tithing, that, you know, somehow that, you know, God's super pleased with them. Yet, you know, Matthew 23, 23 we read it, all the wickedness that they are doing, all the things they are doing to people and destroying people's lives, you know, God was extremely unpleased with all the sin that they're committing. And just their, their tithing on the small things doesn't make up for that. Amen. And if you're in uh, Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> you see the first thing that Jesus said is, is one of the weightier matters of the law is judgment. And today, judgment is almost like it's a cuss word or something. You know, we were just out soul winning this afternoon, and, and uh, there was a guy that said something about judgment. And he basically, and to him, it almost seemed like he's like, well, I don't judge, so at least I got that going on. But, you know, judgment's like, like I said, is one of the weightier matters of the law. And uh, if you're in Matthew 7, verse 1, the Bible says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. 
And this is the passage that people will take out of context and will twist to, to uh, think that just all judging is wrong. And they'll just get the first two words of, of verse 1, judge not. But this is not what Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching, don't be a hypocrite in your judgment. You know, don't judge people for stuff that you're doing wrong. And, and also, he's basically teaching that the amount of judgment that you judge people with, how harsh you judge people, you know, that's going to come back to you. Um, I remember there was a, uh, a Christian movie that we saw a couple years ago, and it was about like this family that was homeless, and the point of the movie was try to, say, to point out like, you know, not all homeless people are just some wicked drunk, you know, there's, there's good wholesome people that can become homeless through circumstances. And uh, there was one scene that was kind of funny, there, uh, you know, the people are living in a car, and it was like this, this guy and his wife and his two kids, one was like in high school, one was like in elementary school. And it's like 10 o'clock at night, and his daughter's sitting in the car. And, uh, you know, he looks over, and he's like, what is she doing? And uh, his wife's like, oh, she's, she's, you know, she's just now starting her homework at 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, that's it. And he's like pulling off his belt like he's going to go spank her. And me and my wife are thinking to herself, like, dude, you're homeless. Like, you are failing at your job of providing for your family to the point that you're homeless, and yet you're going to just lay down the law when your daughter is not getting her homework done on time. Yeah. You know, what a hypocrite to just be so like, I'm just going to, you know, and obviously it's great for parents to lay down their law on their family, but, you know, you got to make sure that you're accountable, you're doing your part, you know, and you're not just basically completely failing in your part and then just coming down on everyone else because they're, you know, they're not doing their part as good as they should. <clears throat> but, um, if you would go to Isaiah chapter 61, but you know, judgment is not something that we should be afraid of. You know, judgment is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. In fact, it's one of the most important things in the Bible. Jesus said it's one of the weightier matters of the law. And I've got a whole bunch of verses here talking about judgment and talking about how important it is and, and how it's something that God exalts and something that should be a part of our lives. If you're in Isaiah 61 verse 8 says, For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. You see, God says He loves judgment. God loves a true judgment. And what is judgment, honestly? Judgment is simply just, you know, making decisions or just giving people what they deserve. You know, if someone does right and you, you bless them for doing right, you know, that's a just judgment. If someone does wrong and you curse them or you penalize them for doing wrong, that's a just judgment. Judgment is simply just giving people what they deserve. And I'll read a few other verses that just exalt judgment. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Jeremiah 5, 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man. If there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. You see, in the book of uh, Jeremiah, God was saying that if there was anybody in the nation of Judah that executed judgment, that, you know, that sought after the truth, he would pardon the city. Showing that God cares about judgment. That if, peop if people are following after a righteous judgment, that that's something that could help spare a city. And when a city is not judging, like Judah was not judging properly, that actually caused that city to be destroyed. Um, Isaiah 30 verse 18 says, And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. So God is a God of judgment. Judgment is an important thing um, that God exalts. It's not, a, it's not something we should shy away from. It's not something that, uh, you know, like the liberals try to say is a bad thing. It's a very good thing. If you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, judgment, obviously God loves judgment. God exalts judgment. And even in our lives, judgment is something that should characterize us. Like I said, not, not like uh, the story I gave or Matthew 7, a hypocritical judgment. You know, you shouldn't have this holier-than-thou attitude where you think everyone's below you. You shouldn't judge people or, or condemn people for things that you're doing. And you shouldn't just come down real harsh on people, you know, unless you're acting perfect. And, of course, we're all sinners, so we should be able to be gracious. And when we do judge, you know, not just, just come down hard on people, but have a little bit of uh, grace there and um, just not be very harsh. But if you're in uh, 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 6, go to verse 2, it says... Do you not know that the saints, the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? 
So things that pertain to this life is something that we should be judging. You know, we should be judging uh, things in this life uh, because, you know, the Bible says we're going to judge the world one day. You know, after the resurrection, we're going to be judging the angels. So, you know, get used to judging now get, and get used to judging righteously based on God's judgments. And because uh, we're going to be doing it for a long time. And like I said, you know, what is judgment? It's just determining what is right and what is wrong. You know, what's good and what's bad. Um, you know, judgment's not always condemnation. It can be condemnation oftentimes, but sometimes it's not condemnation. And uh, if you would, go to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. <clears throat> and here I'll show you uh, when God talks about judgment, and it's the opposite of condemnation. When judgment is basically helping people, and uh, you know, judgment is what we, we would say like a nice thing or a positive thing. If you're in Isaiah chapter 1, go to verse 16. Isaiah 1, 16, the Bible says, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. You see, when the Bible says, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, it says plead for the widow. You see, oftentimes in society, people who are, you know, the fatherless, that's like an orphan, you know, or people who are a widow, someone who their, uh, their husband has died, these people are easily taken advantage of. You know, these are people who oftentimes can't provide for themselves. You know, they might, especially uh, back in biblical culture, when pretty much men were the only one that could provide, they worked on farms, and that was pretty much the only way that people ate. You know, somebody whose husband died or somebody who didn't have a father, you know, they, they basically just had to rely on the charity of others. It would be very difficult for them to provide for themselves. And as a result, people might take advantage of them. You know, people might, uh, you know, take advantage of them through usury or people might take advantage of them through putting them into bondage or, or other ways. People would take advantage of them. So when it says to seek judgment, it says judge the fatherless. That basically be like the government giving the fatherless what they deserve. You know, giving them uh, justice, we might say, giving them righteousness, not letting people just take advantage of them, but uh, allowing uh, right, you know, uh, justice to happen to them and, and not being taken advantage of. If you uh, go to verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though, they shall be a, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water, thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So God's talking about the city that's basically going to be cursed, the city that's going to come under uh, God's condemnation and God's judgment. He's saying they weren't judging the fatherless. You know, they weren't uh, uh, pleading the cause of the widow. And notice what it says in verse 23. It says, The princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. See, the opposite of justice is someone basically who's like a corrupt judge. Somebody who's being uh, paid off or bought off to make an unjust judgment. So a righteous judge would judge the fatherless and not let people take advantage of the fatherless just simply because you know, they don't have someone to stand for them or maybe they don't have the fin you know, a, a financial standing to sort of buy justice or, or whatever. So because... Um, you know, they, they don't have the money to uh, pay off the judge. You know, in order for the judge to properly judge the fatherless, they better not be taking gifts or, or following after rewards like an unjust judge would be doing. And if you would go to Leviticus chapter 19, <clears throat> Leviticus 19. And, um, you know, there's people out there that want to take advantage of weak people, want to take advantage of the fatherless or widows. And, um, you know, so a, a righteous judgment would basically be defending those people and making sure that nobody takes advantage of them. And uh, if you are in Leviticus 15, or excuse me, Leviticus 19, go to verse 15. The Bible says, 
You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, but thou shalt, thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So there again, a, a just judgment is not having respect to persons, you know, not giving someone a break just because you know them or you like them or they have money or for whatever the reason, you know, a just judgment is basically, you know, giving people what they deserve based on their merits, based on their actions. And uh, if you would go to Matthew, go back to Matthew chapter 23, and I'll read to you from Psalm 146. Psalm 146 verse 5 says, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry, the Lord looseth the prisoners. So there again, God exalts executing judgment for the oppressed, you know, relieving the oppressed, helping them out, not taking advantage of them like some people might do. And uh, this is the opposite of what the Pharisees were doing. And we read Matthew chapter 23 uh, to begin the sermon. Go to verse 14. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So the Pharisees are a classic case of someone who took advantage of the poor, who took advantage of the weak. You know, they are devouring widows' houses. They are basically stealing these widows' houses, I guess, you know, because they didn't have the, the money to pay for it, or, or through whatever, whatever means they are doing, they are stealing and devouring these widows' houses. And that's why Jesus said they weren't executing the judgment, you know. Judgment was something that they were not doing because they were unjustly stealing from these widows, and they're basically being covetous, and they're just taking advantage of helpless people. And lastly, go to Proverbs chapter 13. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 13. And, uh, you know, if you don't have judgment in your life, you know, it can destroy you. You know, it can cause you to go down the wrong path or, or allow uh, sin into your life. Uh, if you're in Proverbs uh, 13, go to verse uh, 23. The Bible says, Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. So lacking uh, the virtue of judgment in your life could destroy you. You know, it could cause you to maybe take advantage of people and, and God could destroy you for covetousness or it could cause you to maybe allow sin into your life when, when there's, there's something that you should be separating from. Uh, the Bible says, you know, we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. You know, there's certain... Uh, maybe entertainment out there, maybe movies from Hollywood, maybe television, or just maybe certain people in your life that would be a, a hindrance to you, that would bring you down. And if you have a lack of judgment, you know, a lack of discernment, you might not separate from those people, and you might allow sin into your life, and it might destroy you. And uh, if you would go to Numbers 14, so that's judgment. Judgment is something that we should have in our lives. It's very important to have judgment to have uh, righteousness and justice, basically give people what they deserve, not have respect of persons, and, uh, but, but you know, give, help out those in need and not take advantage of them. But the second one is mercy. And uh, basically mercy is kind of just like forgiving people, letting things go, you know, being gracious towards people. That's what mercy is. Mercy is something that you know, uh, people understand more. You know, judgment, like I said, has been perverted by the liberals a lot these days. But mercy is something that uh, most people understand the concept of it. And if you're in Numbers 14, go to verse 18. The Bible says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. So the Bible says God's great, uh, great mercy and he forgives iniquity and transgressions. Obviously, that's how you know, any of us could even be saved in the first place. You know, obviously, we've all sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way that any of us can even get into heaven is because of God's mercy or because of God's grace, because God has uh, forgiven our sins, because you know, Jesus died for our sins, and, and, and God's opened the door for us uh, because of forgiving us for our sins. You know, that shows how uh, merciful God is. And you know, mercy is something that char should characterize our lives as well. If you would go to Psalm 25... Psalm 25, we'll start in verse 6. <clears throat> you know, uh, we should be gracious. We should be merciful towards other people in our lives. You know, people are going to wrong us. People are going to offend us. But we should be merciful towards people because, you know, that's one of the, the top three virtues that Jesus talked about. If you're in uh, Psalm 25, verse 6, the Bible says, 
Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. So God's very merciful. God's willing to forgive our transgressions. And it says that God, it says, remember not the sins of my youth. You know, one of the ways that we can be merciful towards people in our lives, that we can be uh, a very forgiving person, is if we forget the sins that people have committed. Um, I remember I heard a story one time of uh, this lady who she could never forget anything. She had a total perfect memory. I mean, you asked her, like, you know, June 24th, 1992, what day of the week was that? And she would say, oh, that was a Tuesday. And it's not because she had some chart memorized. She'll literally, just like how you remember that yesterday was Saturday, she'll just think of the date and she'll think, she'll remember that it was a Tuesday because she could not forget anything ever. She just had this perfect memory that she couldn't forget anything. And I remember I was talking to my mom about it because it was like a, a documentary show that we saw. And my mom was like, oh, wow, if only I had a memory like that. You know, that must be really amazing having a, a great memory like that. But the lady said that this incredible memory was also a, a huge curse because she said anyone who'd ever wronged her, anyone who she'd ever gotten an argument with, anyone who she'd ever gotten like a heated fight with, if she looked at that person's face, she remembered all those fights, all those arguments, and she said the emotions were just as strong as when she had the fight. You know, because she had this inability to forget things, it's like she had the inability to get along with anybody because everyone who'd ever offended her, she just couldn't forget it. She just couldn't let it go, and the emotions were right there. So sometimes, you know, being forgetful can be a blessing from God because we should be forgetting, uh, you know, the times that people transgress against us, the, the sins that people commit. You know, sins that people's use, sins that people commit a long time ago, we should let this go. And this is especially important. <laughs> important to people that we're close to, you know, your family, you know, your close friends, people in church, you know, these are the people that we should be merciful towards, you know, just like how God was merciful to us, we should be merciful to, towards these people, and we should be willing to forgive them. Uh, if you would go to Matthew chapter 18, and uh, I'll read to you from Psalm 86, 5, uh, the Bible says, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. <clears throat> so God's willing to forgive us. God's great in mercy. God's very gracious and merciful. And he's willing to forgive our sins. And we've got to be the same towards others. And uh, if you're in Matthew chapter 18, this is a really famous parable uh, that Jesus talks about. We'll get into it. Uh, Matthew 18, 21. Uh, the Bible says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So Jesus, or Peter comes to Jesus and says, you know, How many times should I forgive someone if they offend me? You know, is seven enough? And Jesus says, No, that's not enough. He says, Until seven times uh, seventy, which would be 490 times. Basically, Jesus is saying you should be willing to forgive people you know, an uncountable time, you know, amount of times. And then Jesus gets into this great parable. Verse 23, it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. So there's this king, and one of his servants is in debt to him and owes him 10,000 talents. And this is not simply just $10,000. Uh, talent was a unit of measure in the Bible, and it was a, a very large unit of measure. And, you know, it's not clear exactly what it is. Maybe it's possible if you study it out to figure out exactly how much a talent weighs. But just an example, you know, Saul, King Solomon was the richest man on the earth when he was alive. And yet King Solomon received 666 talents of gold uh, per year when he was king. So Solomon received 666 talents of gold. This guy owes somebody 10,000 talents. So this is like millions upon millions of dollars. I mean, even if these talents aren't gold, even if they're something else, even if they're wheat or silver or whatever, he still owes this guy a, a huge, crazy amount of money, like millions of dollars, you know. And, um, but then if you go to verse uh, 25, it says... But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. 
So this king, even though this guy just owes him this crazy amount of money, this millions of dollars, this amount that it's not even possible for him to repay, the guy just basically just flatly forgives him. The guy's merciful, and, and the king just lets him get away with it. And, you know, that, that basically in this uh, parable, that pictures God. You know, that pictures God being merciful to us, even though our sin debt is so huge that it's not even possible for us to pay back uh, the amount of sin debt that we owe God. God just flatly forgives us our sins if we believe on Jesus Christ, you know, and he just lets it go. And, uh, you know, this king was great in mercy. And, um, <clears throat> but then we see what happens to this servant who's just been forgiven. And go to verse 31. It says, So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorrow and came and uh, told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after they had called him and said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. <clears throat> so basically, or hold on, I think I skipped a part. Go back to verse 28. So verse 28, this is what happens. It says, But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. So this guy that was just forgiven this 10,000 talents, somebody owes him a hundred pence. You know, they... they um, they owe him, I don't know what, I mean, the, uh, I think a penny might, a pence perhaps is a penny. Uh, a penny in the Bible is like a day's uh, wage for, uh, for somebody who, who uh, was like a laborer. So maybe, maybe this guy owes him like, it's possible that he owes him like $10,000 if it's $100 times 100 pence. But whatever he owes him, it's significantly less than what he owed the king. It says, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So basically this guy, even though he had just been forgiven this huge amount, he was not willing to let this other guy be forgiven of this smaller amount. You know, it's kind of similar to that in uh, Matthew uh, 7, 1, where basically, you know, he had been forgiven, but he came down real harsh on this person, even though he was in a very similar situation. You know, he didn't have the mercy that the king had. And as a result, you know, Jesus gives a very strong condemnation. And uh, verse 35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother that trespass. So basically, God's not going to forgive us if we don't forgive other people. Obviously, that has nothing to do with salvation, you know. Salvation is just by our faith. You know, once we believe on Jesus Christ, we're saved. Nothing can change that. Amen. But basically, if we in our hearts, if people offend us and we don't forgive them, and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, somebody, and we basically just like are real harsh about it and just don't let it go, you know, God's not going to forgive us of the things on this earth. You know, God, basically every time that we commit a sin, every time we do something wrong, you know, God's going to come down real harsh on us, and God's not going to let us get away with things. But, you know, if we're very merciful towards other people, you know, like, like God's commanded, you know, if we're very gracious towards other and people offend us, we kind of just let it go. God's going to be the same way towards us. He's going to let things go in this life on earth for us. And if you would go to Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, like I said, judgment is very important that we uh, characterize our life, and mercy is also very important that characterizes our life. Mercy is an extremely important virtue of basically forgiving others, not holding grudges, letting things go. You know, that's how we're going to have good relationships in our lives. People are going to offend us, you know. People in church, people in our family, people who are our close friends, the more we're around people, the more they're going to have opportunities to offend, to offend us. And if we're a very merciful person and mercy characterizes us, then uh, you know, we'll be, be able to have good relationships with people. And if you're in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, go to verse 1. And uh, the, the third virtue that Jesus talked about is faith. And faith is simply uh, believing something that you can't see. And Hebrews 11.1 1 explains that. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So basically, faith is when you believe something even though you haven't seen it, you know. If, if you can see something, like if I say, okay, this hymnal is blue, you can see it with your own eyes, you know, that's not really faith. But if I say, you know, my car is red, if you haven't seen my car, you have to just basically trust me what I'm saying by faith. You haven't seen it. 
And go down to verse 6, it says, But without, this is referring to God, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, it's not possible to please God if you don't have faith in God, if, if you're not a person that's full of faith. And I, I like to describe it, faith is like the glue that holds it all together. You know, judgment is a, is a virtue. Mercy is, is another virtue. But faith in God, you know, faith is what kind of holds it all together and makes sure you're on the right path. And if you would go to Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> and faith is extremely important. Many, many times in the Bible, faith is exalted about how important it is. I mean, the Bible clearly says here, right, in Hebrews, that it's not even possible to please God if we don't have faith. You know, we're saved by faith. Salvation comes through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if faith is something that we lack, it's going to significantly hurt our our Christian walk. If you're in Ephesians chapter 6, go to verse 13. This is the the famous passage of the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So in verse 16, Paul says that the shield of faith is the most important part of this armor. It's above all, he says, and and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You see, if you have faith in God, if you have faith in what God said in God's word, then oftentimes that can uh, fix a lot of other problems that you might have. You know, you might have problems in this life as a result of sin or as a result of, you know, maybe a, a wrong judgment that you had or, or, you know, you don't know things. But as long as you have faith in the Bible, you know, that can, that can basically guide you in, in, um, in your Christian life. If you would go to Romans chapter 10, I'll read to you from uh, Romans 1.17. The Bible says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved when we believe on Jesus Christ and put our faith in Christ. But the Bible also says that we should live by faith. It says that the just shall live by faith. You know, if you're smart, if you're righteous, then you will live your life based on faith. You will live your life based on believing the Bible, based on believing what God said. You know, there's oftentimes there's things in the Bible that we may not understand, but if you just have faith that it's true, that'll help you a lot in your life. You know, just think about simple things like, you know, the sanitation laws in Leviticus and the Old Testament, you know. The Bible in Leviticus talks about washing your hands and running water, you know. It talks about staying away from certain things that are unclean, and it talks about diseases and things like that. And, uh, you know, for a long time, maybe science couldn't explain all of those things. But people who had faith in the Bible and people who follow what the Bible says and they live their life based on faith, those people would have avoided those diseases. They would have avoided those uh, pitfalls because they had faith in what God said. Whereas people who basically disregarded the Bible, maybe they only believed in, in what they thought science to be true. They might have disregarded. I mean, you think about... Uh, <clears throat> Even, uh, you know, someone like George Washington. George Washington died because uh, they, they let out too much of his blood. He got uh, pneumonia or he got some disease. And uh, back then they thought that taking some of your blood out would somehow heal you. So they took out some of his blood and he could be better. And they took out some of his blood and they took out some of his blood. This is like the, the uh, early 1800s, I believe, maybe late 1700s. And eventually they just took out so much of his blood that he died. He just bled to death. And, you know, the, the doctor killed him before whatever the disease he had ended up killing him. But, you know, the Bible in Leviticus says that the blood is the life. You know, if, if he would have had faith in the Bible or if he would have known what the Bible said and would have lived his life by faith, you know, he would have known, hey, this is my life. Why are you taking my life out? I don't think this is a very good uh, decision, Doc. So uh, if you're in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 17, Romans ten seventeen says, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our faith, you know, that guides us should be from the Word of God. Amen. And if you would go to 1 Kings uh, chapter 20, 1 Kings chapter 20, 
like I said, as long as we live our life based on the Bible and we let the Bible guide our steps and we let our, our faith and our trust in that God knows what he's talking about. The Bible is not just a fairy tale. You know, the Bible is not written by man, but, you know, the stuff that's in here is actually true and it's actually right. And, and the God who created the universe actually said these words. You know, if we have faith in that, then it will really improve our lives and, and it will basically really help us. You know, live by that faith and walk by that faith if we trust what the Bible says. And if you're in First uh, Kings chapter 20, <clears throat> uh, this is a really famous story about King Ahab. And King Ahab, King Ahab, he was one of the kings of Israel, and he was a wicked king. You know, he worshipped Baal, but uh, God was still dealing with the nation of Israel at that time. So God was still dealing with Ahab, even though he was a wicked guy. And uh, King Ahab is fighting against Syria. And Syria had a king named Ben-Hadad, and he was a wicked person. And God wanted Ben-Hadad to be killed. So God basically pronounced that you know, they were going to uh, have this battle, and that you know, the, the Syrians were going to lose, the Syrians uh, were going to uh, die, and he wanted Ben-Hadad to be killed. And uh, if you're in verse, uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 30, the Bible says, But the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. So this is after the Syrians have been destroyed. King Ben-Hadad flees and he goes into this inner chamber. He's basically hiding out in this room here. And verse 31 says, And his servant said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel, peradventure, he will save thy life. So they're basically saying, hey, we've heard that the kings are merciful kings. So why don't you go out to the king of Israel and maybe, you know, put sackcloth on, put ropes on your head, you know, come out real humble. And maybe the, the king of Israel will be real merciful to you. And like I said earlier, mercy is definitely an important part of our lives. But, you know, like I said, glue, uh, the, the glue of this is faith, having faith in God's word. You know, you can't just take a concept like judgment or mercy and run wild with it if you're not making sure that it it's lines up with the Bible. If you don't have faith in what God said, that should be basically the way you check everything. And go down to verse 34. It says, And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So basically Ahab does have mercy on Ben-Hadad. And Ahab lets Ben-Hadad get away uh, without dying. And he lets him get away just making this deal that he's going to get some cities from. And that's not what God wanted. That was, <clears throat> that was not basically living his life based on faith in God's word. Because that's not what God wanted to do. And drop down to verse uh, 38. It says, um, So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. So God sends his prophet, who basically disguises himself, acts like he's been fighting in the battle, and uh, he's going to uh, put forth this, uh, this fake story to Ahab. And he's going to uh, give him this fake story where he says, like, hey, Someone asked me to watch this guy, this prisoner, and said, like, if you uh, uh, watch this prisoner for me, and if this prisoner escapes, then I'm going to kill you because you were supposed to watch this prisoner. Your life's going to go for his life. And, uh, you know, uh, Ahab gives the right judgment and says, well, you, you know, you said you're going to take care of him, so now you get the death penalty. You're, you know, you're supposed to die for not taking care of it. And then uh, the guy reveals himself in verse 41. He says, and he hastened and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. You know, it was a fake story. He was just trying to prove a point. Verse 42. And he said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. You see, Ahab... You know, was doing uh, mercy, he was doing a good thing, but he wasn't checking it with faith. He wasn't checking it with faith in the Bible. He wasn't making sure that it's actually what God told him to do, and it's actually what God wanted him to do. And he just kind of uh, ran wild with it. And if you would go to a Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs chapter 14. <clears throat> And um, like I said, you know, check everything with faith in God's word. You know, 
judgment is important. Uh, mercy is important, but we've got to make sure that, above all, we have faith in God's Word and that everything that we do lines up with what uh, is in, in the Scriptures. If you're in, Pro- uh, you're in Proverbs 14, I'll read to you from Proverbs 3. Uh, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lead not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So, you know, don't lean upon our own understanding. You know, have faith that what God said is true. When God says something... You know, we should just have faith that it's true. We should just believe what the Bible says and not think that we have a better idea or that we know better. You know, we shouldn't lean onto our own understandings. We should uh, lean upon what God said in the the Bible. In Proverbs 14, go to verse 12, it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So we may think we have a good idea like Ahab. Ahab maybe thought he was doing a good thing by being merciful to King Ben-Hadad. But it ended up leading to his death and his demise because he didn't check it with the word of God. He didn't check it with having faith in what God said. He didn't have uh, faith in what God said. And as a result, he didn't follow what God said. He leaned into his own understanding. And as a result, he was destroyed. So just in conclusion, you know, Jesus said uh, the three uh, weightiest matters of the law are judgment, mercy, and faith. You know, judgment is just giving people what they deserve. You know, if people are doing right and you, and you uh, give them a just, you know, you give them a reward, that's a just judgment. If people are maybe sinful or they're doing wrong and it's, you know, somebody you should stay away from, that's a just judgment. You know, um, and we shouldn't be respecter of persons in our judgment. You know, we should judge righteously. And uh, secondly, mercy, you know, we should be uh, forgiving others. You know, we should be gracious if people offend us. We should let things go if people, uh, you know, uh, sin against us, you know. We uh, mercy should characterize characterize our lives, <clears throat> but above all, we should have faith in the Bible. Let the Bible guide all of your decisions. Amen. You know, just don't just run wild with judgment. Don't just run wild with mercy. Do those things, but the glue is faith in the Bible. The glue is trusting what God said and make sure we're following God's word uh, to the letter of the law. You know, when He says things. So let's close in prayer. God, just thank you, Lord, for your word that uh, we have it to guide us and direct us. And uh, thank you, Lord, uh, that you lay things out for us very plainly, like Jesus did here, and uh, so that we can um, just follow your word and help us, Lord, to all be characterized by these three things in our lives, uh, judgment, mercy, and faith, and help us to serve you with our lives, Lord, and to do great things in your name. And we just pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.